Okay, thank you very much, and uh, thank you for inviting me to come and speak today. I'd also like to apologize that you have to listen to this in English. Um, I'm afraid the education system in the UK doesn't let me speak to you in Dutch. Um, so yes, my name is Paul Briley. I am the timetabling manager at the University of Manchester. Um, this is the university down here at the bottom with the city in the background. Pitch taken on one of the few days it wasn't pouring down with rain, as we, as we have a lot of. Right, um, so I wanted to start today with this quote, um, which actually comes from someone you might know, Margaret Thatcher, um, basically saying that if she was seen to be walking across the River Thames, people would criticize her that she wasn't swimming. And I think this quote has a, a lot in common with working in higher education, because sometimes it feels like no matter how much work and effort we put into things, people will always find fault in what we do. Um, I can see a few heads nodding in, in agreement. You, you, familiar with that situation. So what I want to start off doing today is give you some examples of instances that have arisen whilst I've been working in Manchester over the last couple of years, admittedly quite extreme ones, um, but these are all genuine things that have happened to me and my colleagues. So first story I'd just like to tell you about was, um, it was about an academic who didn't check the room that he was due to teach in. So we publish our timetable in August every year and this lecturer was due to start his course the following February. So he had months to check the timetable, check he was happy with it. He decided to check it the day before his course began. He went along to the room and found the room to be unacceptable. And his first thought about how he might deal with this situation was he sent in an email. This is a quote from the email. And he basically said, you will it's outrageous that you've put me in this room at the last minute. Um, I'm going to write to all the students on my course and tell them that you, naming us, do not value their education um, unless you change my room allocation now. Um, slightly extreme, um, slightly extreme for a first thing you might do rather than just picking up the phone, but this was a, a, a genuine academic who, who reacted in this way. It was particularly um, obsessing for us because he was talking about it in terms of it was all being done at the last minute when really the fault was that he hadn't thought ahead and, and checked his teaching allocation. Okay, second example is someone trying to hold a conference in the middle of term. So normally we advise against this because we have a lot of teaching, rooms are in short supply, but there was a particular academic who was insistent that he wanted to deliver a conference. Now we only have quite a limited number of rooms that we permit conferences in because we only allow food and drink in certain places. None of the spaces he wanted were available. So my team, they spoke to people in cleaning and catering and they made special arrangements that he could have his conference in a room where we wouldn't normally allow conferences. I mentioned before we get quite a lot of rain in Manchester. One weekend before this conference, there was particularly heavy rain and the building his conference was due to take place in, the, the roof of the foyer collapsed and you, and you couldn't get in through the entrance. Um, so we went over and checked. We found that actually we could use other entrances to get into the building. But then we realized that because of the um, damage in the building, the elevators were out of action. And so although he could have his conference, catering couldn't actually get the food and drink to the rooms. So my team did a lot of phoning around, moving people around, um, speaking again to catering and cleaning to make sure that we could find somewhere else to move this to as a one-off event. It was all put in place. And so we got in touch with the guy and said, there's been a disaster, but we have a solution for you. And he was absolutely furious. And he was furious because he didn't like the room he'd been moved to. So we talked him through the options, and it basically boiled down to there was a particular lecture theatre that he wanted. If he got that lecture theatre, everything would be fine. If he didn't get that lecture theatre, nothing was right. Lecture theatre in question was being used to teach students. And in his own words, cancel all their classes, I'm more important than they are. Okay. Now, we have um, a timetabling policy which formally states that teaching takes priority over conferences. So we pointed him to this. We explained to him that there was a formal appeals process if he disagreed and thought this was an exception. 
He didn't care, and he just went straight to university management, stamping his feet, saying how terrible everyone in the university was at helping him and asking for his conference to be moved. He didn't move it, though. It's fine. Okay, third example. Um, this was about um, some broken down equipment. So we, had, we have a lecture theatre with some nice projection equipment, like not dissimilar to this, and it broke. And the way it was wired into the, the room, it, we needed to basically like strip out the walls to get at the wiring to fix the parts that had broken. It was a big job, we couldn't do it in less than three days. So even if we did it at the weekend, we were going to lose a day of teaching. So we made the decision that rather than cancel lectures, we'd wheel in some temporary equipment, everyone could use that, and then we'd just wait until the vacation and do the repairs then. We told all the staff who were using the room, everyone was fine with it, except one guy. And that one guy said, no, you need to fix it now. I'm not prepared to use the projector you've put at the front of the room. I want to use the one here that's broken. And we explained to him that we, we couldn't, we, we physically couldn't do it within the days without cancelling a whole day of classes. And he basically said, well, that's just not acceptable. Basically, he wanted us to change the rules of time and space to suit his schedule. Now, what was annoying about this one was he argued that this was a student experience issue. He said the student experience is being harmed by having this temporary equipment. Um, we did receive student complaints about the temporary equipment, but they only came from his class after in one of his lectures, and we know he did this because we record all our lectures, he put up the email addresses of the people all his students were to complain to. Um, so yeah. Okay, last example, a um, little bit more low-key, this one. Um, you walk into a room, there's a writing surface on the wall. You think maybe it could be moved six inches to the left, that would be slightly better. Who's the first person you contact? The single most senior person in the university. Um, rather than going to estates, rather than going to timetabling, he went to the president of the university, asked us to, mo asked to move the whiteboard. But in this case, he didn't just ask to move the whiteboard. The email was pages long criticizing or questioning the education of everybody involved in timetabling, estates, decorating, all these sorts of things were just torn to shreds in this email because he thought the whiteboard should be here. So they are admittedly extreme examples, but they are real examples. And after we started to have a few of these, we realized there was a common pattern to what was going on. They always began with a genuine dissatisfaction about something. But then in order to get their issue resolved as quickly as they could, they, the individual's concern escalated it in a completely disproportionate way to senior figures, trying to kick up a fuss with students. And then this creates pressure on the people who are dealing with the complaint to resolve it much faster than the actual nature of the issue would require. And when I realized this, I was, all of a sudden I was, had a flashback to when I was 16 years old and I was working in a shop and a customer came in to return a frying pan and he said, I'd like my money back for this. I said, do you have a receipt? He said, no. I knew he didn't have a receipt because we didn't sell frying pans. Um, <laughs> and he was adamant, he wanted his money back. So I told him no, he wanted to see my supervisor. Supervisor came over, told him the same thing. He then wanted to see the manager. The manager came over and gave him a refund just to get rid of him because he was causing so much disruption on the shop floor. And I can remember standing there feeling so powerless that we'd followed the rules and because this person had just been awkward, they'd got their way. Um, and basically, I didn't want my team to go through that experience. So I started to look for a way to tackle this and my first thought was, well, we have a hierarchy, let's go to the managers of the people that are, are raising these issues. So the guy who complained he wanted the equipment fixing faster, um, I went to his boss and said, you know, we cannot fix it in three days. And she said, well, you have to, because he wants it fixing faster. So we didn't really have any success going down the line management route. We found that more often than not, the managers would back up what their staff were saying. So. We then have a number of committees around the university that deal with timetabling. Uh, we have representatives from schools, from estates, from IT. And I took this problem to these committees to say, look, we're having this recurring problem of people complaining in a disproportionate manner. 
Does anyone have any ideas how to deal with this? And basically, everyone shrugged their shoulders and said, well, no, they're, they're academic staff. What can you do? And uh, the thing that did come to light, though, was that it wasn't just us. It was, it was going on all over the university, these sorts of, sort of issues. So I then became aware that there was a head of department, an academic, who'd actually done some presentations in the past on the importance of academics and administrators working together. So I decided to go and see him, and we sat down, and we had a bit of an informal chat about it. He had no answers. He recognized the problem. Um, we did come up with some interesting ideas, which I'll come on to in a few slides, but we didn't solve it or have any brainwaves that day. So the next stop that I took, um, we have something at Manchester called the We Get It campaign, and it's a zero, uh, zero tolerance approach to bullying and harassment. So I decided to go and see the people who run this campaign and ask them whether they had any ideas. Um, they said no. <laughs> he said, you know, technically this isn't harassment or bullying because it's not um, repeat behavior from the same people. It's ad hoc things around the university. But it, they, they didn't have a good solution for dealing with it. So what they did suggest was that I went, go and went and had a conversation with their manager. Now their manager is the director of social responsibility at the University of Manchester. So I went and saw him. I said, I, this isn't really social responsibility, but I've gone round the houses, I've come to you. Do you have any ideas how to solve this problem? And he sort of shrugged his soft shoulders and went, well, no, they're, they're academics, what can you do? Um, and he said, why don't you go and talk to diversity and equality? So I went and spoke to the diversity and equality office. And I said, I don't think this is a diversity and equality issue, but <laughs> let's see, you know, do you, do you have any ideas here? And he said, no, no, I, I can't help you. Why don't you go and speak to human resources? So I got in touch with human resources. That was about a year ago. I'm still waiting for an answer. <laughs> uh, but to be fair, it kind of felt like we'd gone all the way back around to trying to tackle this through line management, and we hadn't really got a solution. So I then decided to try and look outside the university for some answers. So within the UK, there's a group called the Academic Registrars Council, and it has lots of different practitioner groups. Um, there's a timetabling one, and I cunningly decided that I would offer to host one of these meetings. And I put something on the agenda where we split everyone off into groups with questions, and they would spend 45 minutes debating the problem, trying to come up with some answers. And I planted the question of how do you deal with difficult people who complain in this way? Um, we got everyone to write their answers on a piece of flip chart paper, and this is the flip chart paper they came out with. The first thing that was noticeable was that this group wrote far less than anybody else because they couldn't really come up with any great ideas. And the other thing that was quite upsetting was the things that were on there are actually things that we already have in place at Manchester. We have the policy, we have the links with the academics, we have a harassment policy, and we're still encountering these problems. So this journey sort of made us, brought us to a point where we realized everyone recognized this is a problem that we face. Nobody seemed to have a particularly good answer for it. And that having policies and procedures written down on paper wasn't enough to, to tackle it. So just cast our minds back. I mentioned that we had some ideas when I was talking with this academic head of department. One of the things that we talked about was whether the size of the institution was part of the problem. Manchester is the largest single site university in the UK. Um, we have about 40,000 students, and it's also we're, we're based in a big city. So you go home at 5 o'clock on a Friday, you do not see anyone from the university until Monday morning. Previously, I worked at Durham University, small university, small city. You were always bumping into people from the university, and you had much more personal relationships with people. We also talked about the fact that the staff body is always changing. A lot of academic staff are on short-term contracts, and if you've constantly got people changing, it's very difficult to change the culture in an institution uh, because the people you've, you've no sooner trained someone up than they've gone. And we also talked about the idea of whether anonymity was a problem. We, um, I think we get quite good now in higher education administration at being efficient in our communications. Uh, we say, you know, don't phone, don't pop around the office, phone us, don't phone us, email us, don't email me, email the timetabling at Manchester mailbox. And you go from being, I'll talk to Paul about it, to, oh, speak to timetabling. 
just this anonymous thing that exists somewhere in the university. Now, this guy is my cautionary tale that makes me still want to tackle this problem. Um, his name's Steve Rossi. Now, This American Life is a podcast. I don't know if any of you listen to it, but it's um, stories around, from around America. It's an American Chicago public radio station show. Um, every week they tell different stories, and one week they told the story of this guy. He was the direct, well, he began as a janitor in a school in New York State. And over the years, he got promoted and promoted and promoted until he was in charge of all sort of janitorial duties across the county. And he got there through intimidation, um, being bossy, being aggressive, and nobody stood in his way. And his story ended, the reason he's wearing the orange jumpsuit, he went to jail on terrorism charges because he planted a bomb at the house of somebody who upset him. Um, I'm not for one moment suggesting that that's the level of problem we have. But I think it's, it's a good example of how when you let someone get away with behaving in a certain way, or you almost teach them that that behavior pays, they just do it more. Um, this link across the bottom is to a blog post that came out about three years ago. Um, it was written by a PhD student about, and it asked the question, does working in academia encourage this sort of behavior? And the argument went that if you're an academic, intelligence is currency. And if you can show people that you're intelligent, you get research money, you get put on committees, people consult you for your opinion. And a very easy way of demonstrating that you're intelligent is to point out something that someone else has done wrong. And the article itself is quite interesting, but what's really interesting is the comments underneath it. Um, there's one that sticks in my mind from a PhD student who was going to give a presentation. She ran through it with her supervisor for comments, and the supervisor said, that's perfect, that's fine. Got to do it in the real venue. Got to the end of the presentation, and suddenly their supervisor came up with all these criticisms and questions that had never been raised before, as if it was just purely being done because there was an audience to show off how intelligent the supervisor was. Um, there's also a book on this, um, The No Asshole Rule um, by Robert Sutton. And if anything, this book is proof that this is not a higher education problem. These people exist everywhere. Um, I've seen a couple of people just snapping photos of this book. Don't bother. It's an interesting book, but if you're expecting it to have a magic answer in it, it doesn't. It basically tells you two things. It says, don't hire the assholes in the first place. And then once they're there, it, it doesn't tell you how to deal with them. It tells you how to cope with them, about having a quiet place you can go to to escape from them, <laughs> rather, rather than actually solving the problem. Um, but it is an interesting read. I, I would recommend it. Um, OK, so another, another thing um, that I found interesting on this topic, we have a, a weekly higher education publication in the UK called the Times Higher Educational Supplement. And there was an article published in there about a year ago by um, an academic called Laurie Taylor, who writes for it quite often. And he basically, it was a speech that he'd given about how academics view university administrators. And so he, one of the first things he said was, when he started working in a university in the 1960s, he had no idea that university administrators were a thing. He thought that the whole university was run by academics, and, and that was the end of it. So. I know he's talking about the 1960s, but I think that attitude probably persists. I know that when I started working in a university, I was flabbergasted at how many people there were working in the place. And the building I was in, if ever the fire alarm went off and everyone came outside, you were stood on the street going, who are all these people? I, I, I've never seen them before. Um, but, but I think that is a genuine thing. People that come to work in, academia, in higher education do have a perception, and possibly the, the reality is not what they expect. He also said something um, maybe quite critical, but he basically said, no matter how good administrators are at their jobs, academics don't care. It, it's trivial. Now, a prime example at Manchester, we have people who are working on curing cancer. I can produce the best timetable in the world, <laughs> but it is never going to compare to the work that they're doing. Um, so I, I do think there is something in this that, you know, even if you're doing a really good job, it just doesn't register with some people that what you're doing is important. And likewise, he made this comment that, you know, 
compared to being an academic, running a university's finances is child's play. Um, I think I know a few finance officers who might disagree with that one. Um, he also raised the idea that actually calling yourself a manager can be a negative thing in a university and that it's perceived that you're someone who's going to come in and tell people how to do something. And an academic who comes from the standpoint of we question things, we, we want to know why the world is a certain way, we don't accept the norm, you're almost setting yourself up for conflict. And I, I like his idea, you know, you're not a, a genuine academic unless you're discontented. So um, I think there's quite a lot in what he, he's saying there. And another point he pulled out um, was the idea that some of the things that we ask academic staff to do are just completely alien to them. Um, certainly within the UK, and I imagine it's the same here, we have a lot of reporting on how money is spent, how time is spent, and it all feeds into KPIs and benchmarks and league tables. If you're coming at this from an academic standpoint, you don't compartmentalize your time in that way. You know, when you're um, running a tutorial, you're not purely teaching. You're also still thinking about your research. You're thinking about your research when you're in the shower. Um, so, as I say, some of the things that we ask them to do just are completely alien. Um, prime one in timetabling. Why are you asking me what I want to teach when it's like a year until we're going to have to deliver those classes? And the last quote from Laurie that I just wanted to put up here was the idea that basically, as administrators, what academics want from us is they just want us to disappear into the background. They see the university is about teaching and research, and we are not part of that. They see we are there to support it, but we are not the university in the same way that they are. Now, Laurie said when he finished giving this speech, there was no applause from the audience. Um, everyone just sort of sat in silence. In fact, he said there was a noise, and it was everyone going. <laughs> so, um, when Times Higher Education ran this article, they provided a counterpoint from an administrator, a guy called Simeon Underwood, and he pulled out quite a few things. Um, the first thing he said was, academics might have a view of there was a golden age of universities when there was hardly any administration. Those days are over, and it's not our fault that that's happened, that's government policy, it's um, the market in higher education, that's the way of the world. And if we weren't here, the university wouldn't function. They also raised the idea that um, administrators can upset academics by telling them that they must do something. And that, again, back to this idea that as soon as you give an instruction, um, you're almost setting yourself up to be questioned. So try and avoid that word. And that then leads on to his next point of, if you are going to ask people to do something, you need to be prepared to justify why you want them to do it that way. Otherwise, you, you don't stand any hope of, of getting them to do it. And the last thing he said, um, which was a bit of a shock for me, actually, um, establish a relationship on their terms. Um, this is how I dress for work. I, I wear a shirt and tie to work every day. That's just what I do. I think it's smart. An academic once actually pulled me up on it in a meeting um, for dressing like this and told me that it wasn't appropriate in a university. Um, and it, it was this idea that if I, if I dressed as they dressed, I wouldn't be making it into a them and us situation. Um, now, the problem is I like my ties, so I've carried on dressing like this. Um, but, but it was an interesting thing that I never thought of before, that we potentially sometimes engage with academics in ways that they think are quite strange and not um, academic or, or suited to higher education. So, summing all this up, what they were basically getting at was higher education has changed. Um, what people used to think a university was like is not the case anymore. Um, but as administrators, we probably need to be a bit more sympathetic to academics, where they're coming from, and um, the sort of pressures that they're under. But going back to my original point of getting these complaints from people, I'm still not prepared to sit and accept that that is how life has to be. So what we've come up with at Manchester within my team, we've, we've basically come up with some rules of engagement, if you like, of how we how we try and work, that I'm not saying these are a magic bullet, I'm not gonna say that they um, will solve all your problems, but we have found them to be very beneficial. So rule number one, beware the audience effect. So this is the idea that 
we've all been in those meetings when you have a bunch of people around a table and before you've even said something, you know the individual who's going to have a problem with what you say. And in a previous role when I worked at Durham, there wasn't a guy like this and it didn't matter what you proposed, he would have an issue with it. And it, it, it got to the point, it was, it, was, it was really putting a downer on everyone, his constant criticisms. And so what we actually did was we got rid of his audience. So when we needed to do a consultation and he needed to be involved, rather than getting everyone around a table, we held one-to-one -one meetings with everybody instead. And obviously that's more time consuming, um, but it had two benefits. The first one was because he wasn't standing in front of other people criticizing things, he didn't, his, his negativity didn't infect other people. people. Other people didn't respond as negatively. But the other thing that we found was that actually when you got him one-on-one, -on -one, he was a completely different person. He was much less negative, much less um, obstructive to things you wanted to do. And I think it played to this idea that maybe he was using these group environments to demonstrate his intelligence by picking flaws in what we were proposing. So I think this is probably, if I could say, like take away one thing, I think this is the biggest one that we've um, had benefits from. Okay, second item, don't be a faceless service. So I kind of touched on this before, the idea that um, we, we have got very good at hiding behind email addresses and online forms, and we, we don't have those kind of personal relationships anymore. Um, we had an issue at Manchester where there was an academic who was particularly unhappy about uh, the, the, the rooms he'd been allocated for his teaching. And he sent in an email explaining why he wasn't happy. And we sent one back saying um, why, we thought it, why we'd done it the way we had and why we couldn't change it. And then he sent another one back. And each time these emails were going back and forth, more and more people were getting copied in. And the names of the people were starting to get more senior. And you could just see it, it was escalating out of hand. And so I was, I was sat writing the email, and the next email in the chain, and I just thought, this isn't going to solve the problem for anybody. So instead, I got up, walked across the campus, went to his office and knocked on his door, and we had sort of a half hour sat at his table talking things through. Um, he began quite angry because that was, that was the position we were in. But the whole meeting actually went very positively. He came away with it with a better understanding of the constraints we were under. We came away with it with a better understanding that there were reasons why he needed things the way that he needed them. Um, and I ended up with a free place on a Teach Yourself Korean course in his department. So, um, so it, it can be really beneficial to sort of break out now and again and, and meet people face to face. And it also touches on what Simeon Underwood was saying about meeting people on their own terms, you know, going and meeting them in their department in, rather than summoning them in for a meeting in a, a, a cold conference room. Okay, the third thing um, I think has been really useful has been building relationships around the university. And um, I've got a couple of examples of where this has helped us. First one was when I was at Durham, um, I started a staff network for lesbian and gay staff. And it was like an informal um, after work drinks once a month. Um, and I met a lot of people through that that I would never have come across otherwise. Academics, administrators from all over the university. And what was really interesting was it gave us a forum to talk about the things that were affecting us in our work life. And, but without any of the pressures of work, so someone would come in having a, a complaint about, um, you know, oh, why have I been asked to provide this information? It's completely ridiculous. And I could give a bit of an insight into why that was, but I was actually completely unrelated to the problem at hand. And where that really began to reap dividends was when we began to realize that those people we'd established those relationships with were going back out to their departments, talking with their colleagues, and then when their colleagues complained about things to them, they were fighting our corner which was a, a really unexpected benefit. The other place where this really played out well, um, I got quite friendly with an academic in our School of Electrical Engineering at Manchester, and we'd sometimes just um, catch up for a coffee every now and again. And I'd talk with him about things that were going on in timetabling and that we'd like to do, and he'd talk to me about things that were going on in his department and he'd like to do. And one of the things I said to him was, I, I had this idea of, of better planning the timetable um, but whenever I tried to suggest it, nobody was interested. 
He then went back to his department and suggested that exact same thing. And everyone was in favor of it because it had come from an academic, not from me, even though it was exactly the same idea. Um, so building relationships with people around the university above and beyond what you need to to get your job done can be really beneficial. OK, the fourth thing um, is to be sympathetic. Um, sometimes I know when people phone up or, or email in with a problem, we, you know, we can put the phone down, have a good old rant with your colleagues about them. But I think it's always worth remembering that just because they've kicked off with you, it's not necessarily you that is the problem. It could be that they've had 10 major issues today, you're the 11th, and it's just been that's the thing that's tipped them over the edge. Um, so although they might be pointing their anger in your direction, it might be inappropriate, undeserved. Um, but also, thinking back to the, you know, the world that some of our colleagues work in, as administrators, a lot of us are quite lucky to have permanent jobs. Lots of academics are always looking for that next research grant, that next, um, next, next placement. If we are pestering them for information that they don't see as appropriate whilst they're wondering how in six months' time they're going to pay the mortgage and feed their children, maybe we should be a little bit more sympathetic. Um, so I, th I think the other area of being sympathetic is also being aware of issues in the sector outside of your own personal area. So that when you're having conversations with people, it's not all about my area, my area, my area. You can show them that you have an appreciation of the bigger picture and the other issues that are going on around the university. OK, and the fifth one, and this is my probably um, the one that people associate me with the most at Manchester because I love Excel. I cannot get enough of Excel in producing graphs. Um, as administrators, we have access to all the university's core systems. They are absolutely jam-packed full of data. So use it at any and every opportunity you get. Um, one of the things I've been going on about for quite a while at Manchester now is about changes to the timetable. Once the timetable's published and the students are here, people keep changing the timetable. And we've seen students get really upset when they have to quit a part-time job because the new lecture time doesn't fit. And I've been going around to different departments trying to sell this message of you need to clamp down on these changes because it affects students. And I got to one of these meetings and one of those people was there that I knew was going to have an issue. And he, he stood up and he said that the problem you're not understanding is the reason we change the timetable is because the students want us to do it. We're purely doing it for the students. Well, I had my data at the ready because we categorize the reason for every change that comes in. And I was able to come back at him with, last year, 2% of your changes were done in response to student requests. 25% of them was because the lecturer didn't like the time he was taught teaching at. Um, so that was the kind of thing. If we'd not had the data, that academic would have made that statement, and it would have just stood, and people would have accepted it as fact. Having the data at your disposal is a hugely powerful thing, and I would encourage you all to use it at any opportunity. That's the end of my presentation. Um,